Uh, so uh, like Glenn said, we're going to talk about tips, tricks, and features. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about wearing your LVAD equipment, different ways um, for that, troubleshooting alarms, talk a little bit about showering and maintenance. Um, Dustin's going to chime in when he has things to add. And then he, at the end, is going to talk about the future technologies. And we'd love to open it up for questions um, if anybody has any at the end. So, you know, what we send people home with um, is the holsters. And um, then they have like kind of a belt that they wear around their neck or um, sometimes put around the waist. Um, but we try to encourage everybody to find what's best for them. Um, we usually um, direct people to Google. Um, Etsy has a lot of options. Um, you know, when they first started with the VADs, um, people started wearing those conceal and carry shirts. Um, and that kind of um, led to a lot more options that different companies have been making. Um, there are a lot of people who will go with a fishing vest um, just because there's a lot of pockets on there. And I've even seen some of those fishing vests that are made out of the mesh, and so they're not as warm. Um, there are products out there for men and women. There are some um, vests um, out there that have pockets sewn on the inside that make it really easy for people to have all of their equipment contained right within um, their shirt. Uh, there are backpacks that are designed. Um, I know some people just like to have a backpack. They don't have to worry about it. And it's a little bit more evenly distributed the way it is. Um, then one of the newer things is, um, if you're wondering what that pair of pants is, um, those are actually pants that are made for football. It's called a five pocket girdle. People are able to put their batteries, um, say, down in the leg pockets and maybe their controller in the hip. Um, it becomes a little bit more complicated if you have an alarm while you're shopping at Target and have to take your pants off to um, get that controller out. But a lot of people like that option. Um, it's easier to carry the weight on your legs and they just wear their pants over the top. Um, the belt you see on the bottom is actually a sleeping belt. Um, this is a picture of one with the Heartware, um, as opposed to the Heartmate, Heartmate 2 or 3. They make them in a lot of different um, options. And that's kind of good because I know a lot of people will just set their controller on the bed while they're sleeping. And they think, oh, it's okay. Um, it'll just lay there right beside me. But you know, if you have a wild dream or have to get up in a hurry to go to the bathroom, that controller can fall right onto the floor. So this kind of makes everything um, well contained. I know patients who use the sleeping belt, the controller goes on the belt, their cord that they plug into the wall kind of goes down the end of the bed between their legs. And as they roll over, the cord just kind of stays there. I have, I have been trying to encourage people to try out the sleeping belt because I think it's really good for maintaining the drive line. Um, as people know, um, the drive line is a huge source for infection, and the best way to fight that infection is by um, making sure the seal um, stays intact. Um, you know, at some point in time, we hope that the skin will completely grow around the um, drive line. And that's definitely an option for um, maintaining that so that you don't get a driveline infection. A lot of times those driveline infections, once people get them, they'll never go away. Um, and the infection can even be seeded in the pump. So um, we that's why we um, work so hard with people on maintaining their driveline dressing and making sure their controllers don't get pulled. Um, I think probably one of the biggest options out there are there are different LVAD shirts. Um, I know this uh, woman, I, I haven't um, you know, experienced her products myself, but um, there's a lot of options online for LVAD shirts that people are using. Um, I know they come in short sleeves, they come in sleeveless, um, have pockets for the batteries, the controller, 
Um, and also those Velcro strips to keep your lines tucked in. And then a lot of times people are just able to wear a regular shirt over the top. And, um, you know, when you're out in public, nobody even really knows that you have a, um, a, a LVAC. Um, I know the shirts can be expensive, um, especially for people who, um, you know, are trying to figure out how to pay their medical bills and all of those things. There's a lot of different options. I think I've seen them for as low as 50, as much as 150. It kind of depends upon how much you want to um, customize it. But I think there's a lot of really good options out there. And if you consider that you probably need to get three or four shirts and wear them, you know, every day, um, I think you definitely would get your money's worth out of them. Um, especially those people who are like, I can't stand my equipment. I don't want to wear it. It's too much of a hassle, which I know is a real thing for people. Um, sometimes the shirt and being able to contain everything and then be able to wear your regular clothes on the outside is a really good option for just making the best of the situation. Um, so um, a lot of times people have their controllers tucked in um, somewhere and maybe they'll get a beep and they don't really know where it came from by the time they're able to get the controller out, it might be gone. And so then people are like, I don't, do I need to be worried? Do I need to be concerned? Um, not knowing what the alarm is, it um, makes it difficult for you to address the situation. So um, we teach this in um, our beginning education, but we teach a lot of stuff. And I know when people go home um, within a couple of weeks, they you know, are like, I don't remember this, I don't remember that. So this is kind of a good review. Um, you are able to view your last six alarms that you have had on your controller. And the way to do that is you would press the display button um, which is the square button on the right hand side and then the silence button. I always cue people to remember if they want to display their alarms, they're going to hit the display button and the alarm button at the same time. That will bring up the most recent alarm. And then as you hit the display button, you can scroll through and you'll be able to see the last six alarms that you've experienced. Now those low voltage advisories, sometimes those are what happens when the battery is kind of sliding around in the clip a little bit, or if the contacts aren't clean, um, low flow, for those who have the HeartMate 2 and the HeartMate 3, they're gonna get low flow alarms when their flow is less than 2.5. And then power cable disconnects, of course, that's just a natural um, part of having an LVAD. Um, those alarms are gonna show up as well. So. Um, that's a nice little trick for if you're out and about and have an alarm and by the time you get your controller out, um, it's gone. We oftentimes when people call and we're just, we're happy to have them call. We have people on call 24 hours. You know, if you can't remember, we can talk you through that as well and try and troubleshoot for you. All right, so a problem that's happening, and I think it's happening a lot more as people are using new and different wearables, is they'll just kind of get these short beeps that are there and gone, there and gone. And a lot of times it's one beep and then it's gone. Um, when you call a VAD coordinator, well, probably the first thing we're gonna do is talk you through cleaning your contacts. Um, and those are the gold metal parts that are on the bottom of the battery they're inside the clips. And um, you also have contacts on your battery charger as well. So um, cleaning it with rubbing alcohol once a week will help um, those contacts stick together a little bit more. And um, you'll have the energy to be able to pass from the battery to the clip. I usually just recommend that people use a bottle of rubbing alcohol and a Q-tip to clean those. Um, of course, you wanna make sure you're not connected to them when you clean them. Um, and if you're gonna clean the ones on the battery charger, you should make sure it's either unplugged or turned off. Um, if you have cleaned them and you continue to have the beeps, um, you there's always the option to change your clips. I kind of suggest um, that people, if they think they've got a clip that's maybe a little loose or not working as right, take a Sharpie and put an X on it. 
Um, everybody should have two clips in their backup bag so they can exchange those out and um, see if those work better. Um, and if you're able to determine which is the offending clip, you know, give us a call and we can replace those clips for you. Um, sometimes I notice that it just is kind of the way people wear equipment. Sometimes if people wear the uh, football pants, um, maybe their batteries jiggle around a little bit more in their clip. Um, so sometimes if you can just try and stabilize it, that would help. Um, you know, if, if you're having those alarms frequently, you should for sure call a bad coordinator on call and we can help troubleshoot them. Um, Dustin also um, just recently talked about an upgrade. Maybe you can explain that a little more, Dustin. Yeah, happy to. Uh, so this is pretty specific to the HeartMate 3, uh, so unlikely going to be an issue with HeartMate 2 patients. But when HeartMate 3 was originally made, um, the system controller, the way that it's programmed uh, is that it's set to alarm uh, if one of those contacts uh, is lost, you know, between the clip and the battery, and that alarm essentially presents immediately. There's really no delay or lag in, in, in that communication, which is what is leading to a lot of these short beeps that people get. Like Darcy said, it's oftentimes just one beep. Um, so we still recommend that you go through all the steps that, that Darcy laid out. However, if you are somebody that's still having issues, um, it may be beneficial to upgrade your controller. And you'll see there, there's a little uh, sticker. It's a, it's a sticker that, that would be on your controller. It says HeartMate 3 uh, and then the version software there. So we, we recently came out with version 1.7 um, and there's very minor upgrades in the software. So nothing where people are required to receive this upgrade. Um, however, anybody newly implanted, probably as of uh, January, February, will just automatically be given this controller with this version. Uh, what they did is they reprogrammed that alarm so that it no longer alarms in, uh, immediately, but they've now added a five second delay, which will allow, hopefully, if, if this is one of those deals where you're just moving around and there's just that brief loss of contact with the clip, um, it will eliminate those beeps and alarms and, and, and fix that. So I have done this on a few occasions uh, in my area where uh, patients have just been frequently getting these alarms. Uh, and they've tried changing out the clips, they've tried cleaning them, and we went ahead and upgraded their software to version 1.7. Uh, just be aware that it, it, so it's a very simple process, uh, and, and as long as, you know, we just coordinate it with the, the VAD team at the U, uh, but do know that it does require a controller change, uh, and so your VAD team would need to make sure that they are comfortable and, and, and feel that that's a safe thing to do, but otherwise the process is very simple. Uh, and I think the big thing is, is if you're having alarms or you're having beeps a lot, call the VAD coordinator on call. You know, we're happy to help out with that and to kind of walk you through the troubleshooting. Um, all right, showering. I know that has been a topic that people talk a lot about. Um, the, probably the first rule of showering is you should never shower until a VAD coordinator has approved you to shower. Um, We've had some people who decided they were going to go rogue and try and shower first um, before they um, were approved and things like that didn't necessarily go very well. Um, hey, so the I'm sorry. Were, oh, yeah. Yeah, so let me interrupt real quick. Um, if you want to take the spotlight back, I'm just afraid that um, you're not uh, going to be in the forefront. I think Dustin's in the, in the spotlight. I think if you want to grab that back, who was able to get that before. Sorry, folks. Just Let me try. No, that's fine. Yeah. Hey, Darcy, right click on your webcam. Yeah, I'm, I'm clicking on that side by side. There we go. I'm not sure why that's not. OK, I'm going to make that big for a moment here. It's actually okay because he's not the spotlight anymore. You're default by up. Oops. Now you're uh, kind of, you've got the news reporter. <laughs> there you go. Is that better? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you'll be fine. Okay. Now. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. 
Thank you. Um, no, that's totally fine. So, um, you know, the big things are um, making sure that you've been approved to um, shower by a VAG coordinator. Um, there are some videos online, even if you go to heartmate.com, um, good videos of um, how to use the shower bag. Um, it's definitely important that the controller is facing up. Um, you know, it has a little window on there so you can see if you have any alarms. Um, covering your drive line is probably the biggest um, hurdle that people have. Um, you know, we usually start people with the aqua guards, um, but I have also had people who say a big tegaderm works good as well. Um, other people like to use the blue blenderm tape um, to go around the outside of the aqua guard. Probably you're not going to be able to completely 100% um, waterproof your dressing. Um, they will get damp. And that's why we always recommend um, people changing their dressing after they shower. The other thing is um, I know some people who've installed hooks in their showers because I think it's a great idea to hang the back of the shower bag on a hook. Um, but just a reminder that that um, shower bag should always be attached to the body. Um, if you were to slip and fall, your body goes down to the bottom of the shower and then the controller would stay up there on that hook and they can do major damage to the drive, the drive line. So um, the bag should always be attached um, as a picture of our gentleman in the corner there um, is kind of carrying it like a messenger bag. There's also an option to use the strap and to put it around the waist. Um, so those are definitely recommendations. Um, another reminder <laughs> that um, showering should never happen while connected to wall power. Um, always be on battery when showering. Hey, Darcy, I'll just throw in there real quick too, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, go ahead. In this image uh, of a controller, um, and uh, and we, we make the comment here about keeping moisture away, and I, I know oh, that's obvious. Sure. But yeah. I think it's just helpful to to comment because we do see that a, a fair amount. You know, people will call and say, "Hey, you know, I've got this green goo <laughs> uh, on my on my controller or in my controller, I should say, uh, and it, it makes people pretty nervous and they're not sure what it is." Um, but uh, we can confidently say that anytime you see that green goo, that that means that somehow moisture. Um, did get into the controller. And, and what I've learned from our engineers, it doesn't have to be much. You know, you don't have to go fall in a lake um, or take a bath with your LVAD to make this happen. Sometimes it can be pretty uh, a pretty mild amount of moisture or, or water. Uh, oftentimes we will follow up with centers and ask, you know, does the patient recall getting the controller wet? And most of the time they say, no, they, they, they don't. Uh, but just be aware. So what's happening, um, this is sort of an oxida oxidation process and I'm, I'm, I'm not real smart on this, but essentially there are uh, the, some of the copper wiring inside that controller sort of interacts with moisture and causes this green substance to sort of start to, to produce. Uh, and then uh, it will sort of kind of start to work its way around the inside of that controller. And, and in some cases will be visible as you can see here on the controller. Um, generally, this isn't going to cause any issues with your controller and, and won't necessarily cause any alarms, certainly wouldn't cause malfunctions with your device. But of course, you'd still want to have that looked at and likely you're going to uh, want to swap that controller out for a new one. So thanks, Darcy. I just want to throw that out there. And just a reminder that swapping out the controller for a new one should only, only be done at the direction of a VAD coordinator. <laughs> Very true. All right, um, sometimes some of the things that will happen um, after people have had their LVADs for a long time is they kind of forget about the day-to-day -day maintenance that's required. Um, Justin has uh, put very nicely on the slide um, the stuff that needs to be done daily, weekly, monthly, and the page it refers to on um, in the patient handbook. Um, things that should be done um, daily um, for people who have heart mates, you know, making sure that um, the they don't see the red button on the back. 
Um, and also for those that have the HeartMate 3 should not be able to see the yellow line on their modular cable connection, and then that should be tightened. In, tightened. Oh. Um, some of the weekly checks are, um, as we said before, cleaning the um, contacts on the batteries and the um, clips and even the battery charger with rubbing alcohol. Um, going back to daily just makes me think, um, um, also rotating your batteries. So most people who have heart meat should be going home with eight batteries and the batteries are good for three years. There's a date on the battery that um, tells you when the battery is manufactured and it's good for three years after that date. Um, but you wanna make sure that you've used all eight of those batteries equally. Um, so, you know, I usually recommend you have four batteries out, you use them for a month. Um, two batteries go in your holsters and two batteries in your backup bag. Every other day you're gonna um, trade those. And then at the end of the month, you put those four batteries away and bring out the four batteries that were in your closet, under your bed, your freezer, I don't know, wherever you keep your extra batteries at home. <laughs> Um, I don't re I recommend keeping batteries in the freezer. Um, <laughs> then uh, <coughs> on a monthly basis, you're going to remember to exchange those batteries um, and also check your batteries to see if they need to be calibrated. I think this is probably one of the things that people miss the most is the calibration of the batteries. Um, the, the battery charger actually will let you know when it needs to be done. The batteries want to be recalibrated every 70 cycles. And when you put the battery in the slot, you're gonna get a picture of a broken battery, just like you see in that picture. Um, you'll wanna hold the button down until the um, picture of in the circle um, is shaded in. And that means it's recalibrating the batteries. And what happens with that is the battery will completely drain and then recharge. And after it's been recalibrated, it will give you a more accurate picture of how much charge is left in that battery. Um, at the six month mark, um, we're gonna ask you to charge your backup battery in your um, uh, extra battery controller, your emergency backup battery in your extra controller. You can either plug that into batteries or plug it into wall powers. You should do a system test on that one at that point in time, just as you do a system test on your primary controller daily. Um, the other thing that people often forget is to change those uh, three AA batteries that are in your MPU, the mobile power unit. Um, there may still some be, be some people out there that have um, the regular big power module, but those who have the mobile power unit, the smaller one, those batteries should be changed every six months. Um, there is a picture if the batteries are dying, um, you're gonna get the yellow battery signal and a beep that is indicating that those batteries need to be um, changed. And I do have a picture, I'm gonna try and bring it up. Can you see that? Yep. Can you see the maintenance? Okay. So this is what we give to people when they are first implanted. Um, we have a laminated copy, and I always recommend that people put it on their refrigerator, someplace where they can see it. Um, Dustin is very proud that this is part of his legacy as a bad coordinator. He made this great maintenance schedule that we have. Um, and you can just put a Sharpie and um, write in the months going across. Um, there's a reminder to um, rotate your batteries monthly to clean the clips on um, the contacts and the batteries um, each weekly, um, once a month, um, checking that need for calibration. Um, a reminder that calibrating a battery takes 12 hours and the charger can only calibrate one battery at a time. Uh, cleaning the battery charger contacts, um, charging up your backup battery on your backup controller every six months, as well as doing the self-test. Um, the yearly equipment maintenance, um, usually you'll get either a MyChart message or a phone call from Megan, 
reminding you it's some time to bring in your appointment for the yearly checkup. And really that's the battery charger. So um, when you come in, you can leave it with a scheduler, come in, have your appointment. And when you're done with your appointment, it should be done. What happens is our biomedical engineers come and look at it um, and um, clean it, give it a once through. And I've actually had two patients within the last month where biomed has come to me and said, oh, their battery charger, it, they need a new one. There's something wrong with it. And the patients hadn't really known. So it's a good safety check to have once a year. Um, and then the last is to remember to change your MPU every, um, your batteries in your MPU every six months. So um, if you don't have a copy and would like a copy, just go ahead and reach out to your VAD coordinator and we can email you one or send you one in the mail. Thanks, Darcy. Um, and thank you, Glenn, and everybody here for uh, having me on and uh, getting an opportunity to present to you guys. Uh, as Glenn said, I've worked at the U for quite a few years prior to joining Abbott, and I know this group well. I had a few opportunities to partner with you guys in the past, and, and I'm really glad that Glenn reached out to Abbott and to us the local team to kind of find other things to do together uh, re regarding LVADs. And uh, so this has certainly been great to have these VAD web uh, webinar series. Uh, my colleague and I got the golf to the, uh, the golf tournament earlier this summer, which was a great day. So uh, hopefully we can continue uh, partnering with you guys and, and being involved. Uh, what you guys do is pretty, pretty fantastic. So uh, my a quick plug on that note, July 15th, 2022. Great. I'll, I'll put that down here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we plan to be there again. Yeah, we'll we'll send it out. We have a newsletter in the, at the at the printer right now. It goes out at the end of the month, and uh, it'll go out to all of you. And uh, Darcy, hope to see you next year. So we have, in fact, we we, we have a few surprises. So look out. I like it. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah. So so my half of the talk here is going to be kind of talking about future technologies. I think this is a topic that everybody gets excited about. I know I certainly do. And, uh, and and I think, um, you, you know, we, we we have a lot to, I think, offer, especially now that we are this company, uh, Abbott, which is a pretty big company with a lot of different resources. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to see uh, what, what our team can, what our engineers can come up with. Um, I, I'll, before I get into it, I have to make a very bold disclaimer. Um, everything we're going to talk about here is unofficial, um, certainly not approved yet. Uh, I'm not going to be able to provide any timelines, of course. Um, all, uh, a lot of this stuff is still under wraps, even to the point where uh, I'm not even aware of what's happening. Um, so we're really going to be kind of just touching more on some of the general concepts uh, and ideas that that our organization is moving towards. Uh, some of it's a bit more tangible and happening for sure. Some of it's probably a bit further out um, uh, in, 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 a very, in earlier design phases. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have any pictures <laughs> that I can really share either, so it's mostly just words. Um, uh, but uh, but but I hopefully I can add some color here uh, in commentary. So what does the future hold for VADs? Um, you know, I think VAD technology has come a long ways in the last 20, 30 years. Um, we've really established um, its place uh, in, in managing heart failure, uh, and we've really gotten pretty good at managing um, managing people with them. Uh, we, we've seen a lot of great improvements. Um, so we're, we're kind of now moving into a phase that we can really add to that and, and focus, I think, more on on um, some of the quality of life issues. I think VADs were, were created in originally simply as a life-saving therapy. Um, so there really wasn't much attention paid to anything other than just keeping people alive, right? Uh, but the, this technology is really advanced to a point where we get to think about a lot of other things besides that, uh, which, which I think is also a bit more exciting for people. Um, and so, so I think what you see with some of the things uh, that we're working on, uh, there's more of a focus uh, on that. Um, so the first thing that I have here on the list is a smaller pump. And, and this sort of came about, this was in the works for a while, but I think this gained some, uh, some more traction or attention uh, when Medtronic announced earlier this year that the, the HVAD was no longer going to be uh, in use. That, I'll tell you uh, from the company perspective, that, that came as a shock even to us. 
Uh, we didn't even see that coming. Uh, and uh, but know that you know for for what it's worth, know that our company is is taking that news uh, very seriously. We're not taking it lightly. I can certainly tell you that people aren't sitting back thinking that hey, you know we own the market. You know we're the only device out there. Uh, and in fact, I think it's the opposite. I think the, that added quite a bit of pressure uh, because we need to make sure we do this right. Uh, everything that we come out with going forward is, uh, uh, you know, at this point anyways, uh, a patient's only option. So it, it needs to be very solid. Uh, but with a smaller pump, um, the mentality here is uh, the hardware did provide a little bit of an advantage in its size, um, more specifically when you think about uh, the pediatric population uh, uh, and, and even some smaller patients. You know, for example, I hear from colleagues in Japan um, that these pumps uh, can be a bit large for, for people uh, in their country. And so having a smaller pump is something that I think um, there's more pressure uh, on us now to, to come up with. Uh, the good news is um, because that was already in the works, uh, it sounds like things are moving along nicely. And um, because the, they are not planning to actually change the pump at all. So it actually will be a heart rate three. Um, so the rotor mechanism and how the device functions will, will be the exact same to what we have currently. All they're doing is shrinking the outer dimensions of the device, some of the electronics that run it and making that smaller. So the hope um, is that this device will be able to fast uh, move pretty quickly through approvals and to get out there. Uh, um, so we will see where that goes, uh, but that's definitely on the list. Another thing that I think is pretty exciting to think about um, is new peripheral equipment. So talking about the controller, the batteries, you know, how you plug into your device at night or at home, and the battery charger. Um, the, for those of you that have been around for a while, you'll know that this equipment has been around quite a long time as well, and uh, it is quite dated. And uh, it's not that people are not paying attention or just not caring about that. Uh, something that I've learned being on this side of, of the world, uh, being in the industry, is that uh, it's amazing how many checks and balances and uh, um, um, submissions that need to be made to the FDA uh, and testing has to be done before these things can be rolled out. You know, this isn't just like a, you know, an iPhone or in our television. Uh, this is equipment that's connected to a human being uh, and supports them. So uh, this stuff has to come out in uh, and work well. So um, this peripheral equipment has been uh, in the works for quite a while, uh, but it has been rolled back a few times, largely due to just um, uh, safety issues, making sure that it's 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 sound. And so we are moving forward with it, and it does sound like this could be coming uh, relatively soon. We'll see. Um, something that I'm particularly excited about is um, there's been a lot of um, emphasis or at least um, people being vocal that they'd like to see this equipment being backwards compatible, meaning um, it, it could work for patients that already have a HeartMate 3 uh, and not just for newly implanted patients. Um, so I can't speak to that for sure as a guarantee, uh, but I will say that that is uh, very much uh, uh, known to our R&D team. Um, and if there is an option to make this backwards compatible, I, I can imagine that, that, will, uh, that they will make it happen. Uh, in addition to that, you'll notice that that, uh, that monitor sitting on the power module, the HeartMate Touch is what it's called, uh, that is already out and was recently um, released. In fact, at the University of Minnesota, we just got done, Darcy and I were actually together a week or two ago, training a bunch of the inpatient nurses on this device. Uh, and this is sort of our, our segue into new technologies. Um, this, is, um, uh, this is going to sort of allow these new peripheral equipment uh, components to function. Uh, because we're hopefully going to start moving more towards wireless technology. So the new controller, at least uh, it, it, what it sounds like, will have wireless abilities to connect. And so uh, this iPad platform will allow us to do that, meaning, for example, you'll come into clinic and uh, you'll just sit down in the clinic room. Darcy will walk in with the iPad and she'll be able to just connect you um, that, that way without physically connecting to the power module. Um, so that I think is pretty exciting um, and certainly moving us towards uh, a more wireless world. And to sort of carry on to that, um, the, they also want to start uh, looking into remote monitoring. So being able to go a step further and not just be able to wirelessly connect you when you're in the clinic, but also, you know, be able to uh, uh, get a look at your device uh, remotely, whether, you know, uh, you're calling from home, if you're up in North Dakota somewhere, um, no longer having to come to clinic to get connected to a module, but to actually be able to look at look at things uh, uh, wirelessly. 
I, I have no idea where that's at. Um, there's a whole bunch, <laughs> a whole bunch of um, uh, things to deal with in that uh, from there, uh, because as you can imagine, when you start sending this kind of information wirelessly, um, we have to be very, very careful that uh, somebody can't hack the system. Um, and I know that Abbott uh, as a company is very much involved with that. In fact, I remember not long ago, the our CEO was in Washington, D.C., sort of on an advisory board talking about how we properly and safely make medical equipment and devices uh, safe to use in, in this wireless age that we're in. So um, that will not be rolled out until there is very safe, uh, secure connections um, that we don't shouldn't have to worry about somebody trying to hack into a into a device. Um, I would say another major uh, ask for a lot of people um, is, you know, if, if you ask a lot of people what what are some of their uh, difficulties that they have with living with an LVAD, um, I would say the driveline is probably uh, something that just about anybody would be happy to to get rid of. Um, and so that's this has been something that's sort of um, been out there for a long time being talked about. Uh, it's not an easy uh, thing to accomplish, but uh, nonetheless, it's it's a very uh, important thing that people want to see. And so uh, the fully implantable LVAD, um, which uh, you might hear the acronym FILVAS, which stands for fully implantable left ventricular assist system. Um, that is uh, another thing that is uh, very much a, a, um, a major uh, draw. Some people even call it the holy grail uh, of LVADs. If we could get rid of that drive line, uh, bury the controller inside the body, uh, and allow a patient to be able to walk around untethered um, uh, for, for a, a certain amount of time. Uh, this this project is well in development uh, and it is happening. Um, it, it's a challenge, as you can imagine, because you're changing a lot of the system. Um, but the idea, uh, at least from my understanding and from what I've seen, is that it would still, of course, require charging, uh, and there would be essentially a, um, a a charging device that goes over your chest uh, that transcutaneously charges your LVAD. Um, so I kind of, if anybody has like an Apple Watch, for example, you've got this sort of magnetic um, charger that lays on your watch uh, and, and doesn't actually plug into the watch. This, that's sort of how I picture it anyways. Uh, of course, it would be very different in an LVAD situation, but um, that is sort of what we're, we're seeing uh, being developed. Um, I was uh, fortunate over the summer to be invited to a what they call a clinical expert team. And so the our internal engineers uh, are bringing some of us, people like myself in, kind of into the fold and uh, asking for our recommendations and, and making sure that the what they're designing is gonna make sense in the real world, not just on an engineer's bench. Um, so I've been on monthly calls with this team and sort of advising them along as they're nearing uh, um, the, the final stages of, of designing and developing this. So again, no timeline certainly, uh, but I think this would be a very cool thing to see uh, in the LVAD space uh, moving forward. And then lastly, uh, looking uh, probably further down the road, and this is very much just in the research phase, um, uh, but the idea of physiologically smart pumps uh, or responsive pumps that have sensors built into them. Uh, and I think this would be pretty fascinating, although we don't even really know what this would look like. But uh, the idea that these L LVADs, you know, are, are f at a fixed speed, right? So they just sort of, we tell it whatever speed to run and it runs at that speed. And it really doesn't take into consideration the kind of activity level that the person that has it uh, is doing. Um, and of course, our hearts uh, are responsive, right? Our hearts work harder or less based on, on what we're doing. And so the, the idea with this would be to integrate a pump that can actually change uh, its function based on what you're doing. So if you decide you want to exercise, the pump speed would go up. And if you go to bed at night and you're sleeping and resting, uh, perhaps the pump speed drops a little bit. Um, there, there has been talks about integrating what's called uh, the CardioMEMS device, which I don't know if anybody's familiar with, but it's a it's another device that Abbott has. Uh, it's essentially a sensor um, that can uh, sense your pressures uh, in your heart, or uh, one of your pressures in your heart, um, and actually will help uh, clinicians uh, dose your diuretics. Um, so one of the thoughts was uh, to maybe even integrate that device into an LVAD so that we can have an idea of what the right side of the heart is doing and what your, your pressures in the heart are doing. Uh, and maybe that could speak to the LVAD uh, and help it uh, adjust its speed. So 
pretty cool stuff, but certainly nothing. It's all ideas right now, but I'm sure there will come a day uh, where um, where these devices will be smart uh, and be able to um, uh, adjust to, to or adapt to, to what you're doing. So in a nutshell, or it's just sort of big picture, those are the those are the big things that are on the list for for Abbott and what we're working on. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, over the next coming months and years, uh, we'll be able to start rolling some of these things out and, and people will be able to start using them. So um, with that, that is all I have for technologies. And we've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, so we'd be very happy to take any questions or comments. Great. Great. Thanks, Dustin. And uh, Darcy, thank you as well. Um, if you've got a question, um, just go ahead and put those in the chat function um, uh, or the Q&A um, that you'll see um, up above. And um, let's see, I'm just going to see if we've got them here. Oops, I hit the wrong button, excuse me. Yeah, looks like uh, I saw Mark's name was up a moment ago. Perhaps he's typing a, a uh, oh, it says meeting chat is muted. Well, why is that? Let's unmute that. I don't know how that happened. Sorry about that. Um, okay, you should be able to, let me just double check in, unmute for, um, yeah, should be able to type in there now. It's, uh, it's set that, or Scott, you may need to do that actually. Scott Stevens, if you would unmute. Yep, I'm working on it here. Yeah. Uh, apologize for that. In the meantime, I've got a couple questions to throw in as a segue for us. Um, one is, you know, Darcy, I've got to ask, and this may help you guys out too, as well as the patients directly. What's the number one question that you guys tend to get? Like, what seems to be the most routine question? And somebody's like, oh, I knew that, or oh, I forgot, or whatever it might be. But what is, um, what is that? What do you think it is? Um, I think a lot of it is on the maintenance. I think like, you know, oh, are you are you plugging in your backup? Oh, shoot, no. Um, but I would say the number one thing that people are forgetting is calibrating their batteries, recalibrating their batteries. It kind of just seems to, you know, fly under. We do education in about five days and we talk about a lot of stuff. And um, people go home, they're like really overwhelmed. And um, we always kind of are like, oh, the number of times we hear people say, well, no one ever told me that um, just because they just don't remember. I, I say going home with an LVAD is kind of like going home with a new baby. It's a brand new day. It's going to change your life, hopefully for the better, but it's scary as heck. Um, the difference between having an LVAD and a baby is we have someone on call 24 hours. So <laughs> there's always someone you can talk to. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, it sounds like we may have a trick or two out there. Um, I'm not sure if we're we're going to be able to get uh, get him on camera. Uh, we may have an issue around that um, just because of how this one's set up. Um, but if you've got anything to suggest, we can do that. Uh, that said, uh, Dustin, I guess what you know, I'm going to kind of on your side. You know, as you've talked to patients, because I know you see patients regularly, you've talked to uh, counterparts of Darcy's. What's the number one request you hear from everybody? You think you're talking like requests just for? Uh, Gee, I wish my heartmate did this. I wish my VAD did this. Aside from, I wish I didn't need to carry these big heavy batteries. Or is it that I wish to? And it's in. And, and by the way, when saying that, what is it that you think is a solvable problem that's going right. to be easier solvable problems? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you just hit it. I think um, batteries tend to be the biggest request, at least from an equipment perspective. I mean, and I certainly can't argue with that those things are heavy. Um, I, you know, you add a controller in there, it's just a lot of stuff to haul around with you. So I would say ever since I've started, batteries is easily the biggest um, request from a R and D perspective. Um, and fortunately, I think you know, without being able to say too much, that does seem to be a Assuming what we have in the pipeline for new peripherals is coming, uh, that will be a very significant uh, improvement on the new equipment uh, compared to what everybody's used to. So hopefully, I mean, I think that request was happening when I was a VAD coordinator 
four or five years ago. Uh, so, so I, I think finally, after all these years, we might finally be able to deliver on a complaint that we've been getting for longer than I've been around, maybe. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. You know, um, it reminded me of another um, is um, in this backup scenarios uh, and battery backups and things like that. I know a question kind of comes from time to time about, you know, uh, I don't know, power outages seem maybe, maybe we notice power outages more frequently these days around the, around the residential areas, uh, certainly with uh, weather changes, those tend to impact now. And um, what are your recommendations around that? Is it a never ever? Is it a, you know, it's okay if your house is on a battery? I mean, obviously this is something you want to be specific with your your coordinator and make sure they follow through, but uh, perhaps Dustin, you've got a couple of words you might mention around that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, and Darcy can probably add in here as well. I think when it comes to power, you know, uh, it's always a concern, right? Especially like around here in the spring, we get these bad storms that come through. And uh, so a couple of things, uh, you know, I always you know, like to remind people that, you know, this is another reason why it's really important to do your maintenance, uh, your routine maintenance, because those batteries, if you've got eight batteries, uh, and you're routinely, uh, you know, rotating through them, they should always be fully charged, right? So that if there is a power outage, you'll have plenty of battery power to get you through uh, while you're waiting for, you know, a more permanent resolution. Um, so, you know, uh, you know, 70, a, a set, if you have a HeartMate 3, um, you should be getting 16, 17 hours on a set and you've got four sets. I mean, that, that could be a couple of days worth of power in a, an extreme scenario. Um, when it comes to things like generators, though, we, we are very, we f very frequently get requests about generators. Um, and what I would tell people, and I, I always teach this to VAG coordinators and centers, is, uh, you know, generators are okay as long as you clear them with us. Um, there are generators that are not okay. Um, so, you know, before ever using one, we just ask that uh, if you could get uh, the VAD team, um, the exact make and model of your generator, our engineers can cross check it for you and, and either say yeah, yay or nay to, to using that. So, uh, and I think a lot of, I, I think, especially the further rural you get, um, there are a lot of people who like to have a generator in place um, for emergencies. I also I get that question a lot. Um, should I get a generator, especially when we do the pre that education and show the pumps the first time? What I tell people is that um, you know generators are probably not the greatest to plug yourself into, but if you were going power was going to be out for several days, that it would be probably be a better option to charge your batteries on a generator rather than plugging yourself into it. It's a good tip. A fun question. Has anyone ever plugged it into their Tesla? <laughs> you know, that's a good question. I should ask, you know, the new Ford F-150 um, electric, they say you can run your house on it for three days. So imagine what you can do to an LVAD. <laughs> <laughs> that's really great. That's some outdoors folks that would really love to have an opportunity. Uh, great. Uh, Mark Corliss, I think your microphone is open. And it sounds like you may have a, a question or a suggestion if you want to offer yeah. that. Yeah, I have a, just a couple of tricks that I think might be helpful to people who are who are listening. Uh, uh, Darcy mentioned the whole thing about when you're hooked up to the wall at night sleeping and all of that. And for, I guess, at least a fair amount of people, the cord is kind of tough to navigate with. Even getting out of bed, going wherever you got to go and getting back into bed. Um, and I found two things that were very, very helpful. Um, number one, I have a remote control light and they're actually pretty easy to find that are battery powered. So you don't have to worry. Um, uh, and, uh, I just have that by my pillow. It's a very, uh, small thing. You can get them on Amazon, whatever their LED or whatever the new light kinds are. Uh, I found that to be really helpful. Um, and for me, whose cord doesn't allow me to reach all the way to my bathroom um, and which is okay anyway, because trying to move it all that way doesn't seem to be very safe. I just use, these are, and it'll probably work much better for males and females, but I just use a urinal and I, and I put it, uh, and then I, you know, it's just part of the regular maintenance in the morning. I take care of that as well. And that way it's not a stressful experience 
you get, do what you got to do and you go back to sleep and you don't have to worry about the technology and what burdens it may have. So I thought I would add those since we're talking about tricks. I don't think they either any of those are in violation of any of the things that either of you have suggested. So there you go. I think those are really good tips, Mark. And I, uh, unfortunately, it's easier for the men to use the urinal than it is for the women. I, I did not. You got it, big I did, I did. But the all also the fact is that what is it? How many? What's the percentage of male versus females that have these? It's pretty big. It is. It is. But that there doesn't are, mean that there, there are more women um, all the time. Um, right. Heart disease is probably one of the most missed diagnoses in women yeah. because they don't present quite the way men do. But one suggestion I have, if um, plugging your uh, wall power in next to your bed, you can't reach the bathroom. Sometimes people will have a plug in in the hallway between the bedroom and the bathroom. And then your cord actually can swing almost 22 feet. You know, you can get 22 feet away from your bed. So as long as it's in a um, grounded outlet, I will recommend that as well. Okay. Um, you know, Darcy, you actually brought up a, a good point that I think could be helpful. And maybe if you know something off uh, either of you for that matter, off, uh, but uh, something I know we, we can use our platform um, in the future is what are some specific nuances for women? Knowing that they are often, I think, underserved in across heart, you know, across cardiovascular health for starters, um, but certainly uh, inclusive of heart failure into advanced heart failure as well. And I know uh, from a from an industry perspective, there's a focus on trying to close that gap, and so we want to be supportive of that. And so. Anything you have here uh, or going forward, it's an open invitation. So. Yeah, I'll just make a quick comment. I know that uh, I, I believe Dr. Cogswell, who I think many people know here, uh, has done some work in, a, in, in recognizing just that gap uh, in women and heart failure uh, and just being honestly misidentified or or, you know, I, I think it's easy to I think some people and I don't know how much validity to this, but I, you know, speaking from personal experience, I believe it, you know, men complain more. <laughs> um, and so women tend to sort of just, you know, they, they don't recognize heart failure can can oftentimes be such a uh, um, a creepy little disease, right? It just sort of slowly affects you. Um, and so so people can kind of just learn to um, deal with that. There's a there's a really great commercial and I can't remember who showed this to me now, but there's an actress and she's really well known and she did this bit um, about a female having a heart attack. Um, it's really great. I, I, I wish if anybody, you could probably Google it and I forget she's a comedian. And, uh, she basically runs this five minute video of her, you know, getting the kids ready in the morning she's in the kitchen. It's chaos, right? Husband's trying to get out the door. She's trying to get the kids ready. She's making breakfast. She's making lunches, stuff's flying all over the place and she's having a heart attack. Um, and, um, but she completely blows it off. She doesn't, you know, think it's a big deal. And then, you know, the end of it is where she just drops down on the kitchen counter or kitchen floor. Uh, it's really funny, uh, but it's also really, uh, serious, right? I mean, it, it, it highlights it. So I know that, you know, back to the question and comment, I know that there has even been work within Abbott. I think Dr. Cogswell recently spoke for us at like a, a women in cardiology session. Um, so I do think that there is, there is, um, uh, recognition of that and, and places and people are trying to do a better job educating uh, and reminding folks that even though yes uh, as the comment was made I think what is it like 70 80 percent of VAD patients are male um, it's probably 50 50 on who's eligible mm -hmm. yeah great thank you um thank you both Darcy do you have any no, I was just going to say I have a one o'clock appointment. <laughs> I'm sitting in clinic, so I can't, I have to log off, but I really um, appreciate this opportunity to talk to people. And um, probably my favorite part of being a VAD coordinator is the time I get to spend with patients. Um, so I appreciate this very much. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, Darcy, thank you. And thanks for taking time out of a clinic schedule. It's probably your lunch if you're even <laughs> enough to get one these days. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, Dustin, thank you, and thank you all for attending. 
Um, we'll close it out now. Uh, with Teams, you just simply leave the room and it'll it'll end on its own. And uh, we'll have the recording of this uh, up in uh, within about a week. So uh, we'll get a note out to everyone once all the recordings are available out there. And uh, thank you all again for for joining us today. Thank you very much.